Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the session. We're very pleased to welcome you all to this session focusing on how to do local advocacy, focusing on CAFAC. So this session has been co-organized by the Advocacy Working Group and by the CAFAC Task Force. And the idea with this session is that you will learn about how to do advocacy, uh, but you will also learn new skills. So this session will be divided in two. There is a first half where you will hear from different um, experts in advocacy. They will share the experience. They will tell you how they do it in their own context. And we have people from Colombia, from uh, Iraq as well. And then in the second half of the session, you will go into breakout rooms and then you will have a chance to practice with uh, a scenario which will be specific to uh, different language so we have language sessions where there will be no um, no interpretation but everything will be done in your own language right um so before we start we wanted to um to ask you how confident uh, do you feel in doing advocacy on CAFAG? so we have a zoom poll that should pop up on your screen and uh, we wanted to hear from you, like, you know, some of you have already some experience, uh, maybe others not so much, and that's why you're interested in this session. So we'd like to hear, like, how confident, are you very confident, confident, capable, if not confident, or not confident? So just give you, like, some time to see. All right, so we have some level of confidence already. Oh, that's good. That's good. So this session will be very easy for you then. I hope we still learn uh, new skills and, and new ideas. All right. So it looks we have a majority of people who are quite confident. Okay. Well, that's great. Okay. So um, now we're going to move to um, Amanda. And so Amanda is working we save the children she's the global head of child protection advocacy and policy and she's also one of the co-lead of the advocacy working group and uh, so she will tell us today about what is advocacy and what tools do we have as the alliance that then we will share with you ananda over to you thanks very much sandra and it is great to be here really excited for this session and to have you all here today uh, kia ora and, and welcome. Um, so as Sandra said, I'm going to give a little bit of a snapshot. What is advocacy? Why is it important? And some of the tools that we have that we want to share with you all. So in terms of advocacy, it's simply influencing decision makers to achieve positive changes for children's lives. So often that's considered in terms of changes to laws, policies or practices. And I think also another important point in the definition is that it can be done both in public and private forums. So that influencing work can happen in a number of channels with uh, decision makers um, and targets. So that I think is a critical piece of, of what we, when we consider advocacy and what it is and the change we want to see that there's different avenues for it. Uh, in terms of the next slide, why is advocacy important? I mean, those of you that are confident in the space will already know it's an essential tool in ensuring that actors are upholding their obligations to protect children and ensuring they're prioritizing their protection and well being across the humanitarian system. It's an important way that we're ensuring we integrate the voices and needs of children in our work. We often see issues that crop up for children's protection. And so the advocacy is a chance to influence those um, issues to try and get more positive outcomes for children, bringing in those voices and needs uh, into the work that we do. And I think importantly, particularly because this is the Alliance annual meeting for 2023, want to flag that advocacy is one of the five core functions of the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action. So it's recognized that it's a critical component in achieving uh, protection for children in humanitarian response. And we have this advocacy working group uh, where we're looking to progress objectives um, and that protection for children across uh, humanitarian action. So next slide. 
In terms of examples of advocacy tactics and products to really bring this into reality and, and make it tangible, um, advocacy can look like uh, and activities around a number of different products or interventions. It could be holding a meeting with key decision makers. So this could be you know, your local authorities, local MPs, national MPs, members of the humanitarian country team, de facto authorities. So that one-on-one -on -one bilateral discussion to try and influence an outcome um, is, is one of the core advocacy tactics that we employ. A second could be holding consultations with key members of communities, including children, where safe and appropriate. So that would help us understand what are the key issues that they're facing, what would they like to see being advocated on, and how would they like to be included in that outreach and influencing. So this can really often done at the beginning of engagement to help inform the development of an advocacy strategy, to build relationships. And often I think one of the important points of advocacy is who's the messenger and that people whose rights are impacted, including children, can be very powerful advocates to decision makers with their own personal messages um, and recommendations to decision makers. Another simple one could be writing a letter that could be both public or private, depending on the sensitivity of the issue. It could be um, a standalone letter. It could be a joint letter with other organizations, which I think is a very useful tactic when you're trying to spread the risk. Uh, if you've got a number of organizations saying the same thing, it's not necessarily attributed to anyone and that can reduce um, any potential negative impact of raising sensitive controversial issues or, or calling out a, a problem as well. And then lastly, another example of a tactic is preparing an advocacy briefing on key issues and recommendations. Again, this could be a private briefing or a public one. So sharing those can influence change, local authorities, community leaders, and uh, often these briefings can set out what is the problem, um, what is the, the context is happening within, what is the solution that we see? And therefore, what are the recommendations to that decision maker? What is in their power to create that change? And why is it, you know, how could it have a, a really significant impact for children and communities? And that's a, often a really useful summary. You could have that accompany a letter or accompany a meeting so that they've got the information to hand in a bit more detail about what are your um, what are those problems and then what are you recommending as the solution or the change that you want to see. Um, so those are some examples. And then the last slide I wanted to draw your attention to a couple of advocacy tools and resources that we've put together as the advocacy working group um, in partnership with the CAFAG task force. These are available on the community of practice um, within the CAFAG uh, group. Um, so hopefully you're all part of the community of practice um, website and able to access it. I think we're going to put a link in the chat at some point during the session um, for you to be able to access those. They include um, an advocacy strategy template, so uh, an outline for helping design uh, a strategy. So headings on you know, objectives, targets, tactics, with some questions to help you work through identifying that key issue. Um, who, who are the people that can, can create the change and what are your sort of messages and solutions that you want to see. A second one is the risk assessment template. So um, that's to help assess when we do public and private advocacy. Um, and mitigate any potential impacts on involving certain groups. I think you'll, you'll all be very familiar with how sensitive a topic uh, children associated with armed forces and armed groups can be. So this template is a tool to uh, help you work through what are some of those sensitivities and issues and what's the level of risk and then are there ways or actions that, that you can take to mitigate that risk and make it safer so that we're not looking at um, censoring ourselves. It's not a decision about if we speak out, but how we speak out and how we can do that in a way that keeps ourselves and communities safe and, and also achieves the change that we want to see. 
Um, thirdly, there's an advocacy meeting preparation template. Um, so if you're having a bilateral meeting with targets, it's um, a series of, of questions and headings to help you work out exactly you know, in that half hour or hour, however long you have, what do you want to leave the meeting having achieved? And what are the key messages and the rationale that, that will help you convince that decision maker to take the action that you're recommending? So it really just helps hone your thinking, your messages, so you can go in there and be really prepared to deliver as quickly as possible exactly what you want to say, having thought about you know, what their responses might be um, and their uh, reactions and, and you know, what's your strongest justification and evidence as to why they need to create that change. And lastly, um, a briefing template. So um, like that tactic earlier, helps put together a concise overview of the issue and your recommendations um, that you can then tailor to suit for your context or the, the type of issue that you want to raise um, and gives you some recommendations on, on how to put that together and, and what should be included. So really hoping that uh, you'll be able to explore those, adapt them to your context, um, and we can draw on them a little bit in the breakout discussion a bit later on as potential tools that you can use in working through the scenarios that we have. Thank you very much and handing back to Sandra. Thank you, Amanda. No, I think this is great. We're really glad that you have all of these tools available for us and then uh, that's great. They've been designed by the Alliance. So thank you. Thank you for presenting them. So now we're going to move to a panel discussion. So we're I'm very pleased to have two panelists today. We have Hilda Molano. Um, so Hilda is a coordinator at the Coalico Network. This is a network of organizations in Colombia. And we have uh, Zaid Shamsadin who is a child protection specialist for TDH in, uh, in Iraq. So we're gonna start with a couple of questions. So we'll start with Hilda. Hilda, can you tell us about the context of Colombia and what was the issue that you faced at the time and the strategies that you, you put in place to advocate uh, for, the, for CAFAG? Muchas gracias, Sandra. Eh, pues efectivamente, uh, hago parte de una coalición de organizaciones de sociedad civil que durante más de 20 años han estado haciendo seguimiento a la situación y a la visibilización de las afectaciones por el conflicto armado contra niños, niñas y adolescentes. Y en particular, cuando eh, estamos frente a las situaciones relacionadas con el reclutamiento y el uso por los actores armados, en Colombia no ha sido un tema precisamente fácil de abordar. Eh, no es una prioridad, por ejemplo, al momento de plantearse las negociaciones con los grupos armados y que precisamente en ese contexto quisiera enmarcar como el compartir la experiencia que como sociedad civil en Colombia tuvimos para eh, aportar, contribuir y visibilizar la situación de los niños y las niñas eh, que habían sido vinculados a una guerrilla en particular en el marco del proceso de negociación con eh, nuestro gobierno y esta extinta guerrilla hoy que corresponde a las FARC-EP. Eh, para el año 2012, cuando se hizo pública la negociación entre el, la guerrilla eh, de las FARC-EP y el gobierno colombiano, no se hizo visible la situación de los niños y las niñas que estaban vinculados a este grupo. Y eh, esto eh, con, nos llamó eh, a, a tener como... Un, un, un mensaje claro en términos de la importancia de incorporar lo antes posible la situación de los niños y buscar precisamente su desvinculación, su salida. Esto nos llevó eh, en primera instancia a enviar una carta al presidente, una carta abierta al presidente de la República, pidiendo la incorporación visible del tema, eh, cómo, cómo se iba a abordar en la mesa de conversaciones con, con, con las FAREP y cuál iba a ser como ese lugar que iba a tener la situación de los niños y las niñas. En el año 2013 logramos una primera respuesta por parte del Alto Comisionado para la Paz que eh, nos planteaba que iba a ser abordado en el tema de víctimas, pero aún no era visible. 
eh, buscamos como todos los recursos posibles que teníamos a la mano y en febrero de 2013 hicimos una audiencia pública en, en el Congreso de nuestro país donde eh, pues está la línea legislativa de Colombia y allí se hizo una audiencia pública con un promedio de 120 niños, instituciones públicas, otras organizaciones sociales, buscando llevar esos mensajes precisamente a la mesa de conversaciones que para entonces se llevó a cabo en La Habana, Cuba. Eh, después de esto, seguir insistiendo, la, el tema no salía, no, no se abordaba de manera pública. En 2014 se adelantaron una serie de foros públicos en el país con el fin de mandar los mensajes de la sociedad y de las organizaciones y entidades a la mesa. Allí logramos junto con las Naciones Unidas eh, llevar un, lograr unos espacios específicos para niños, niñas y adolescentes mayores de 13 años. Logramos que ellos participaran en por lo menos tres foros regionales y un foro nacional y eh, nuestras organizaciones dispusieron de todas sus, sus capacidades para estar en cuanto a mesa de discusión se tenía para que se incorporara el tema de niñez y conflicto armado. Eh, en 2015 ya eh, estaba avanzando la negociación, eh, se convocó por el Ministerio del Interior de Colombia una reunión con actores sociales, eh, cooperación internacional, eh, para hablar sobre el tema y la preocupación que compartíamos de no haber aparecido el tema todavía. Y allí, como Cualico, logramos pues, manifestar nuestras preocupaciones y esa ausencia de respuesta que teníamos de la mesa. Para el año 2015, logramos una conversación con los negociadores del Grupo Armado a través de una organización internacional que nos eh, apoyó para poder llegar a los negociadores que estaban en la mesa. Y fue pues, difícil poder abordar la situación, pero finalmente logramos plantearles eh, la temática y posicionar un poco la idea del por qué era tan importante no solamente abordarlo, sino que fuera lo antes posible. Eh, finalmente, ya al, a, después de conversaciones bilaterales con eh, instituciones del Estado, incluso con, con eh, las personas que eran por parte del gobierno, parte de la mesa de negociaciones, pues plantearles esa preocupación y pues finalmente como la respuesta de ya prontamente se va a abordar la situación, ya se acercaba como el fin de la negociación. Hicimos un informe como consultores de la Defensoría del Pueblo, que es la institución del Estado encargada de la defensa de derechos humanos y llevando como esas preocupaciones, formas alternativas de cómo se podía dar la salida a los niños de las FARC y esto finalmente con los esfuerzos de los actores que se sumaron en, en este ejercicio eh, logramos que el, la, el, al final del proceso saliera un comunicado conjunto de la mesa, el comunicado 70 se conoció de esta manera y allí se reconoció finalmente que los niños eran víctimas, del, de, víctimas de reclutamiento, eran víctimas del conflicto armado en el país y se dio lugar como a, a, a empezar a mirar cuáles iban a ser esas, eh, los pasos para dar su salida y pues iniciar su proceso de reintegración. Eh, como Cualico seguimos al tanto, estuvimos pendientes de la construcción del programa, estuvimos al tanto de la salida efectiva de los niños cuando se hicieron los operativos para su salida del grupo armado durante la, la primera fase de la implementación del acuerdo de paz que se logró entre el gobierno y las FARC y eh, participamos de un mecanismo de veeduría en los primeros dos años del programa que diera cuenta de cómo iba evolucionando lo que se había diseñado para ellos en restablecimiento de derechos y hacia la reintegración. De esa manera, pues el compartirles cómo fuimos utilizando esas herramientas que hablaba Amanda al comienzo y que pues finalmente lograron que el tema quedara abordado de, de alguna manera en, en la mesa de negociación. Thank you, Hilda. Wow, what a great experience. Thank you. Um, now I'm going to ask the same question to Zaid. So Zaid, like what was the, um, the context that you had in, uh, in Iraq and what are also the strategies, the advocacy tactics that you used uh, in Iraq? Thank you, Sandra. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present and advocate for CAFAG in Iraq today on this international platform. Uh, for us in Iraq, uh, as most of you might know, uh, the sudden rise of ISIS in Iraq in 
uh, July 2014, created a very deeply concerning situation for the protection of children, as hundreds of them were forcibly associated with ISIS, uh, armed forces, and armed groups as well. Uh, following the conflict, many of these children ended up in detention centers, uh, post-trial detention centers, uh, and reformatory schools, facing charges related to terrorism, national security breaches, and association with ISIS and other armed groups. Uh, TDH has implemented several uh, strategies to advocate for the rights, protection, rehabilitation, and reintegration of these children by working directly with the government and with the community leaders as well. So today we would like to share uh, three uh, of the main, uh, let's say, key messages that we would like to share from our experience working in Iraq to advocate for the protection, rehabilitation, and reintegration of CAFA. So the first key message that we would like to share is responding to the needs of CAFA in Iraq actually require uh, working on strengthening the government's child protection and justice systems as well. Uh, because as we mentioned above that uh, the situation with ISIS was kind of a sudden, it came out of a sudden and the government was uh, not well prepared to deal with the uh, steps that would come afterwards. So the Iraqi law prosecutes CAFAG with terrorism charges, uh, even if they had no combat or military, military involvement with armed forces or groups. Uh, the post-trial detention centers have no child protection knowledge, no child protection skills, uh, and do not know how to deal with these children and what type of needs they would have that are different from needs that other children might have in the detention centers. Uh, the government social workers is not equipped and trained to provide proper integration support, rehabilitation support to CAFAC. So basically these children were just being charged with terrorism and they were being put into these detention centers without uh, proper services to rehabilitate them to make sure they go out into the community and become active members uh, in their community again. Therefore, in addition to providing direct support uh, through some case management activities, PSS, counseling and psychological support, psychosocial support services inside the detention centers, uh, we actively advocate for the government to consider children as victims of recruitment and not as criminals, not as terrorists. Uh, of course, this has to be had to be done through a lot of uh, advocacy work. We had to do a lot of meetings with government officials, ministers, ministries, and the organization of public workshops and meetings between different ministries to advocate improving the service provision for CAFAC, and also at the same time to advocate for uh, the way that the Iraqi criminal law uh, deals with these children and how it views these children. Um, these meetings, some of them honestly were private. Uh, it depends. On, it depended on the sensitivity of the issue at hand of the topic, and also uh, the sensitivity of the persons from the government that we are meeting. Uh, so, depending on that, we would sometimes have public meetings. Sometimes we would have a private meetings. Uh, we would also collaborate very closely with the Ministry of Justice, uh, since they are the ones dealing with. Uh, these children inside the detention centers and also the Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs because it's their responsibility to provide rehabilitation services to these children inside the detention centers and also uh, reintegration services, reintegration support post the release from the detention centers. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, Thank you, um, please. Working... I'm sorry, we are running out of a bit of time. Um, but thank you. I think, you know, this is like a really good uh, overview of all the work that you've done with the different ministries in a very uh, complex setting. Um, now I'd like to, um, to ask Hilda, what was maybe in just one minute, what was the result of your advocacy? Like if you can say like in a couple of sentences, what was the outcome of all the tactics that you've used, all the meetings, the report that you developed? Uh, all those uh, regional, national forums that you set up with the children. So what was the outcome of all this work? Logramos finalmente que los niños fueran reconocidos como víctimas del conflicto armado y esto quedó tanto en comunicados como en el acuerdo final, en el acuerdo definitivo. 
eh, que uno de los criterios de implementación de todo lo acordado fuera el interés superior de los niños, niñas y adolescentes y un, un programa que fue eh, un, un escenario de lecciones aprendidas y eh, que nos demostró que flexibilizar ciertos elementos y entender a los niños y las niñas en, en, en sus condiciones particulares lleva a mejores respuestas institucionales. Eh, logramos que a este grupo se le entregara la, el componente de indemnización económica eh, de manera prioritaria y años, muchos años antes de lo que usualmente hubiera sido previsto de manera ordinaria. Gracias. Excellent, really, really impressive work. Thank you, Hilda. Um, Said, same question to you. Like, what was the result of all this work that you did with the different ministries, like the private and public meetings? And then um, I know, like, you you work with all of those different of local authorities as well. So, like, yeah, you know, just one minute. How can you um, show the the outcomes? So, Sandra, the government seems to be more open to allowing service provision inside the detention centers. They're also more open to building their own capacity to provide these services to these children. Uh, and also, there is also now some room for us to be able to discuss the laws and regulations more often, and they're more open to these discussions. Also, we've worked on community acceptance for these children a lot, so we see a lot of religious leaderships issuing uh, statements uh, to their communities uh, talking about how they should be accepting these children back into the community, how they should be working with these children to rehabilitate them, to reintegrate them, uh, to considering consider them the same as other children in the community. So we're seeing changes in the government level and in the community level and also on the child level themselves. Thank you. Excellent. Really impressive work as well. And I know, I know personally Iraq a bit, so I know how complex this is there too. So uh, really impressive. Um, thank thank you. you. Thank you both of you for sharing your experience. And I'm sure like I've seen some comments in the chat. I think a lot of people were also very interested to hear from, uh, from your experiences in, in very different contexts, like Colombia and Iraq. These are um, quite different contexts, but still we see how advocacy has really led to putting uh, those children at the center, treating them as victims, uh, just including them in the peace process in the case of uh, Colombia. Great. Um, so now we're going to move to the practice session. So you will um, see appearing on your screen, hopefully, uh, some links to breakout rooms. In the breakout rooms, we're going to go for a short summary, a short scenario. And then we're going to discuss like what is a problem and what are the strategies, what are the tactics that we can put in place uh, to address the issue in this uh, fictional country. So um, that's uh, the plan. We're going to have about 20 minutes for that. So that will uh, then give you know, enough time for you to go for um, the, the questions. And then we all come back in plenary for, for the wrap up. Okay, this is this is us then. Then great payment for for both of us to be able to facilitate. I don't know if you're happy with sharing your screen then with the scenario for people to look at. Um, maybe I can also post it in the chat as well. What we're going to do, we have about twenty minutes, is um, for you all to have a quick read through of the scenario. And then um, we've got some key focus questions for us to answer and work through um, to, to have a discussion on the advocacy strategy and tactics. Um, so I've put the scenario in the chat and hopefully Payman will share his screen as well. Um, I can also read it out for people too. So in recent weeks, um, a violent conflict has emerged in the capital between armed groups and government forces. Currently, there's no available data on child protection issues, but there are increasing anecdotal reports that most armed groups in the streets and in informal checkpoints have high numbers of boys under the age of 15 armed and supporting the fighting. So a tentative ceasefire has been secured by all sides uh, for at least three weeks, and an agreement has been signed uh, by the parties to to the conflict to permit humanitarian aid into key areas. 
So this um, sadly might be a, a context that's very familiar uh, to many of you, uh, breakout of armed conflict, um, uh, issues of, of children being associated with armed forces and armed groups, um, and uh, issues of you know an early onset emergency, um, uh, potentially lack of access, um, and also uh, issues with you know hearing unverified reports of recruitment of children. So um, what would be great is uh, for people to, to be able to come off mute and chat um, about what they think about this scenario. Um, is there a problem within it that you think we can be conducting or you could be conducting some advocacy in your organization to address? Um, and we'll move into some of those focus questions. Um, so yeah. If, if people see from that scenario and we can capture um, in the Word document itself kind of people's responses as to the, the issue they'd like to see addressed. Hi, Amanda. Hi. May I share? You may, please do come in. So I see that the data is not, is not clear, but it's still, uh, we do have reports of uh, children under the age of 15 being put into armed groups. Uh, so I think that's the main issue that should be addressed. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. And I think you, you raise an important point as well, that even if we don't have official data, there's still a lot that we can decide on how we engage on um, informal data as well. Exactly. So data, you know, data verification, but um, the issue of recruitment. Uh, Biora, please. Thank you, Amanda. I think what we, we can be able to keep in mind, because I, I think most of us don't want to, to hear this, but this is the factual truth, because in any community, <clears throat> majority usually tend to be the children in terms of the population demography and uh, what we usually see. So there will be high chances that children will have to be recruited into un armed conflicts. And that, that, that one will either come naturally or through recruitment or through other purposes, which can maybe be forceful or just because for the call of duty and for the lack of the members that are there. So I think the best solution in terms of uh, preventing children from being uh, recruited in armed conflict can be a bit uh, tricky. There will be no one solution, but the best will be always to try and see how advocacy can be done so that uh, the number of children being recruited into armed conflicts will be, will be reduced and mm -hmm. grooming for children to be fighters uh, can be prevented. Yeah, definitely. And that's a really good point about the, the demographics as well. Um, so yeah, it sounds like we're getting a honing in on that strategic objective, decreasing the, the number of children being recruited and used and, and that risk that's coming through. Um, I have to be creative because we haven't given you a lot of information in this scenario, but um, in terms of working through um, advocacy targets and who, how we might go about doing this um, would be great to hear from people. But first, Erica, please come in. Yeah, sorry, I just wanted to um, kind of add into, I guess, part of the other quest point and then which links to this is if we're talking about uh, stopping recruitment. Oh, Erica, we can't seem to hear you. Oh, I can hear you. Oh, oh you can? Yes. Oh, that's wow. weird. Okay. Can you hear me now? Can other people hear you or is it just oh, me? Oh, sorry, because I'm in the English channel. <laughs> well, I'm in the English channel. Let me switch. Okay. Is that better? Erica, speak. Okay, can you hear me? I can, yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank <laughs> Thanks, you. Julie. Oh, cheers. Okay, sorry. Um, so for me, there is the question in terms of uh, the problem that we're that we're targeting is it is it just the new recruitment or is it also to have the demobilization of child uh, of children uh, of CAFAG um, and particularly because we've got the age of 15 is what you're talking about so that's clearly a link to international humanitarian law so we don't even need to get into um, into other things but um, without knowing the context if you talk about who are the advocacy targets there is that that question as well of um which i think Bjorn had had brought up as to how and why are children joining 
So to understand that, is it is it the armed groups that or or say the UN or the SRSG that you're targeting in terms of their their conversations that they're having with the armed groups? Or is it also advocacy targeting at a community level with with families and community members who may mm -hmm. well be um, encouraging children to join? I think that's a really important point. Well, both both those points I think are really useful because um, advocacy can be about immediate issues like recruitment, but I think your advocacy strategy can also be thinking about the longer term and messaging about you know, not only the prevention, but what to do with children that have been recruited and, and that longer process. So I think really important. Um, and yeah, we haven't got that question there as to what's the root causes of that recruitment, but I think obviously a absolutely critical question for developing an advocacy strategy and thinking about targets is um, uh, yeah, being able to delve into what is that reason for recruitment. Um, and so it could be as well, uh, one of the activities when we get to that piece is to go and, and find that information or to hold some consultations to understand that a little bit better as well, um, to help influence the, the strategy. I guess we can we can make some assumptions here if that's easier to, um, uh, in terms of thinking about targets. It's probably um, both those things, both armed groups recruiting plus uh, communities supporting this or children feeling like they don't have other options. There could be a number of, of potential root causes. Um, do others have thoughts on this or sort of ideas of, of potential targets that would be useful to engage with around this issue? They could be allies or they could be decision makers. Actually, it uh, depends also on the on the fraction that the armed group is uh, working for. There could be some form of uh, religious person or religious uh, sect that could impact them and impact the way they do things. So maybe kind of like some form of leadership, not military leadership, like religious leadership, religious guidance, something like that. I don't know how you want to put it. Yeah, yeah, no, really good point. Um, Danielle, you've got your hand up. Yes, and apologies if this dials back or is in any way too broad, but I think another question I'm curious to answer would be, even before exploring some of these more specific questions, is what information is missing that would be helpful and important for us to know and understand, and where are the potential uh, avenues that we can obtain that information and almost creating a map of, of what we know and what we don't know and what would be helpful or necessary for us to understand to then move to some of these other questions in terms of putting together strategic ad advocacy objectives and, and targets. Yeah, really good questions. Maybe we can pop those under the risks for now um, or add another question there in terms of what do we know, what we don't know and how can we get it? Definitely. Um, and we have uh, just for you payment in the chat um, in terms of targets, government ministries, i.e. security. And um, uh, from Erica, working in faith leaders for addressing some community norms and joining armed forces. And then someone had their hand up. They were going to come in. Xavier, please. Yes, I was going to say um, the government and uh, the government ministries, but I think someone already dropped that in the chat. In the chat so that's why I lowered my hand. Oh, great, great minds. Um, another fourth one there in the chat is um, national intelligence security agencies. Are there others that people are thinking of internally, externally, in terms of the country context? Although this is a local advocacy session. Uh, Xavier, please. Yes, I would say the, the Ministry of Social Affairs mm -hmm. um, in my context, since they are directly um, 
working with uh, children at the level of the government. Yeah. Great. And I mean, one thing from the scenario that's not clear is whether there's a, a humanitarian architecture. Um, but if there was, I'd say being able to communicate concerns and messages to an HCT, um, uh, to the AOR, Child Protection Area Responsibility. Um, and yes, thanks, Abba. Um, some great points there about, um, or you can see in the chat, payment to add them, uh, engaging community members, parents, teachers. I think important for that, that community conversations. Um, and then in addition to the Ministry of Social Affairs, also Ministry for Women, Family, Child Rights. I think that automatically shows how complex often the architecture is in governments for who's responsible for education. protecting children. Yeah, and education. Yeah, good point, Erica. Great. Okay, I'm going to move us on. Um, there's loads coming through. I think lots of targets there that are, are really helpful to think about. But just want to touch on, are there particular advocacy tactics or products um, you think would be useful to be um, uh, including in an advocacy strategy, either to be um, finding out more information or uh, in terms of reaching these targets on the issue we've identified? I'll put back in the chat the scenario so people can see it on the screen since we're scrolling down the page. Um, so yeah, it, I mean, in terms of what uh, other, what tactics you've used in your own markets and scenarios, raising awareness, yeah. And and whatever, would that be through, through um, community messaging or, um, meetings with communities? Xavier. So I think um, using evidence-based report, like the data which is collected from, from the field, we can also use that, most especially when interacting with uh, government uh, ministries and authorities, because we would definitely like to see some data that backs what we are saying. So if there's evidence-based data, we can also use that as well to have a, a wider meeting and it's also so we present this data to, to them to know how much it's affecting the communities. Over. Yep. Yeah, really important. Um, so connected to that payment, evidence-based research is, um, I guess, for briefings and meetings. Um, and then connected to point one, raising awareness, um, community dialogue, person and radio, um, uh, messages through radio TV on prevention. Um, and then a third one, uh, formal communication to ministries as well. So letters and briefings, I guess part of that evidence-based approach, but, but communicating that to them. Briefings, meetings, letters. Uh, I also think um, involving the children is important. So we can also have um, tailored uh, child-friendly um, communication uh, materials. I don't know in which form we can put it. Yeah. Maybe at the level of the community through um, role play and dramatization of some nature to also uh, actively involve the children themselves. Yeah, definitely. And I really like Stella's point there about collaboration with arts and artists um, involving youth-led, child-led um, child organizations. 
and I think that's really important, you know, as part of an ongoing process to understand the issues for them, how they want to be engaged, what the solutions are, I think really big part of, of influencing what advocacy messages we take forward and recommendations. Great. These are all excellent. Um, oh, and um, Abdita K. Mohammed, uh, collaboration with former combatants, um, especially those that might have graduated from a reintegration program. Yeah, I think really important thinking about that power, power of the messenger and their voice um, and showing what's possible as well, making it tangible, I think really important. And I think that that kind of activity is useful for both ministries and communities, mentors for children. Yeah, I think it's a really good point. So I think, you know, where we've got limited resources, thinking about these tactics and products that can be relevant and influential on those different audiences, I think is, is useful. We've got one minute left. Um, maybe just quickly, if people have any kind of risks, thinking about the risks for advocacy that we might come across on the sensitive issue um, that could then be um, gone through a process to how we mitigate those. So the usual risk will be that there will be a lot of denial from both sides because no armed conflicting groups want to accept that they have children. And that mm -hmm. one will prevent them from accepting the facts that the data is already there or you have evidence that the children are there and none of them will be willing to be able to prevent these children being recruited. So mm -hmm. that's that's one of the risks. The other one, you'll be targeted by these groups that perceive mm -hmm. that you're trying to move maybe those children are a huge number of their combatant force. And when you want the children to be removed, they, they might not be able to accept that uh, willingly. And uh, as such, your advocacy might be seen as a, a way of trying to influence their their forces or maybe try to derail their, their armed conflict. So those are some of the risks that you might get. To mitigate that, you might be able to find a way of getting this evidence, document it, and either find outside sources that can now be able to share widely this one so that the conflicting parties might not have an excuse that they do not know that the data is there or the information is there on the children within their conflicting forces. Yeah, absolutely. I think that was a, a, great, a great point. Thank you. Um, and yeah, great to have that mitigation point as well. Um, also in the chat payment, um, perception of partiality, so that as we mentioned, um, risks to children and youth involved. And I think that often shows how how long sometimes these things can take to build up that engagement and trust with groups um, and thinking about how different groups might have different um, benefits to raising issues. Um, so some might have access um, to deliver services and other human rights based groups might be able to, to do monitoring and reporting. So thinking about that collaboration um, and uh, mitigating the risk across, I think, is is important. Yeah, risk of re-recruitment. Um, I think that's a general risk, uh, let alone uh, whether it's sort of in, in conducting the advocacy as well. Um, great. Okay, the breakout rooms are being closed, so people are surging back into this main room. Um, these are all really rich. I think we've, we've managed to do a lot in, in the 20 minutes um, quick fire that we've had. Um, so hopefully those, those questions have been useful to, to work through um, as a, a snapshot and to, to putting together an advocacy strategy. I think we've got, well, we'll give it a second as other people come through. Um, in terms of making those points available, I can we can check with um, Sandra about what we can put on the community of practice. So for those that are um, uh, getting access to the tools, being able to see the, the answers that we've put together as well. Great. Welcome back people as they're joining. I'm hoping everyone's groups were uh, yeah, I think we are all as rich now. as ours. Yep, great. Thanks, yeah. Sandra. <laughs> Thank you. I hope you went well. <laughs> yes, were you able to go through the scenario, like think about some tactics? Great. Yeah, yeah great. definitely. Yeah. 
we had a good discussion in, in our group as well. Okay, so we won't take time to debrief because I think uh, really the purpose was for you to practice it in your own language and to have that discussion in small groups. Um, so yeah, I think now we're coming to the end of this uh, of this session. I hope this was useful. And uh, so before we close, I just to remind you that all the tools that Amanda talked about in, during the presentation are available on the Committee of Practice. So uh, some of you are probably already there. Um, this is a space where you can talk safely about anything related to CAFAG. This is a place where you can learn about uh, learning events like this one, about the new resources that are being developed by the CAFAC Task Force, but also by all of you. So this is a space for you to share, share tools, share uh, information, ask questions as well. So we're there to respond to your questions if you need any help to develop or implement programs with CAFAC. So on this committee of practice, uh, the, all the tools are shared. They are available in the four languages. So in uh, English, French, Spanish, and Arabic, and you can easily download the, them there. And uh, before we close, I also like you to, if you can um, go into the chat and then put one thing, one thing that you learned today, but don't press send. Um, so just go to the chat, type something that you learned today that you felt was, was interesting, something new. And then when I will tell you, we will count down um, to one and then we're all gonna press send together. So it's gonna have a chat for everything will come at once. So I'll just give you a short minute to think about something you learned about today. And then when you're ready, three, two, one, go. So you can all press send and see something you've learned today. Data verification, great. Importance to not say uh, what to do. Um, particularly when the message is going through NGO. So that's something that we talked about in our group in French, how to better strategize your advocacy. Great. Power reflection and being inquisitive. Benefits of working together. Awesome. Thank you all. I hope uh, I don't see, yes. Okay, if you move, back up, you will find all the links to the Committee of Practice. So for those of you who are not there yet, we strongly encourage you to register um, today. You can click on the link and then uh, we will um, register you for the, the Committee of Practice. Thank you, everyone. Now I'm gonna hand over back to Healthspath for just uh, the closing of the day. Mm -hmm.